Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about one strand of my work, which is um, on uh, uh, using genomic data uh, in social science or moving toward, um, um, toward the world where genomic data is, is, um, can be used uh, in social science. Um, so the work I'm going to talk about um, is uh, the, the product of many people's efforts. It's highly collaborative, interdisciplinary work. Um, Dalton um, um, should be on this list. You know, there's just not enough uh, space on one slide to describe the, um, the dozens of people who, um, uh, who contribute to the work I'm going to be talking about. Um, and, and this, you know, from economics, sociology, psychology, statistics, genomics, uh, it requires a lot of different perspectives. Um, now, the, um, the, what motivates me in wanting to combine social science and genomics is the prospect of allowing us to do better social science. And I think there's a, a number of kinds of ways that genomic data could help with social science. I've listed a few of them uh, on the, some, what, some of what I think are some of the most important on the slide, but there are, um, so for example, um, uh, studying genomic data could help us learn about the mechanisms um, underlying behavior. And one recent paper that, um, uh, that my collaborators and I did, which was focused on subjective well-being and, and depression, um, when we looked at the results that came out of genetic analysis, uh, what we found is that, um, is that a lot of the genes were involved in um, the glutamate receptors, which is actually a bit of a surprise because a lot of the literature had been more focused on uh, monoamine uh, uh, neurotransmitters. Um, so that's the kind of um, thing that you can learn from um, genomic data that could then guide um, uh, work on, on biological mechanisms. A second kind of application for genomic data, or use of genomic data, is to help us do empirical work um, that may itself have nothing to do with genetics. Um, for example, um, uh, if, you could use, if you have a genetic variable that is sufficiently predictive, and I'm going to talk later about polygenic scores, which are indexes of genetic variants that combined can have substantial predictive power, like a polygenic score for educational attainment that explains 10% of the variance in people's uh, <coughs> education. Um, then you could use it as a control variable in any study that is just trying to estimate a treatment effect on ed ed educational or achievement outcomes. So let's say, for example, you do a randomized experiment where you're interested in the effect of providing free preschool uh, to kids. Um, that kind of experiment is very expensive to do. Um, sample size and power is really at a premium. Um, having a powerful control variable that you can collect inexpensively, like get a saliva sample and genotype the people and then construct a polygenic score and control for it, can dramatically improve your power. Um, so even if you're not interested in the effects of, of genes, just having a good control variable um, can be very useful. Of course, you might also be interested in um, in a, in a non-experimental setting in controlling for genetic factors in order to um, uh, unconfound genetic and environmental factors. And that would be another use of genetic data as a control. Um, in, in some special circumstances, you could think of using genes as instrumental variables. I know, um, you know Dalton has thought um, a lot about when this may or may not be uh, appropriate, but I'll give one example where arguably um, the assumptions required might be met would be a case where um, you have a, a gene that's a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor gene that's involved in the metabolism of nicotine. Um, those genes are pretty well understood biologically, and, um, and we believe that they affect um, the, uh, how quickly the, the body metabolizes nicotine. So you could use such a genetic variant as an instrument for smoking if you then want to study the causal effect of smoking on something else. And you know, you, you can may be able to argue in that kind of situation that the gene is unlikely to directly have some other uh, direct effect on, on the outcome. Um, and finally, um, we're um, often very you know, interested in, in studying gene environment interactions um, or relatedly uh, targeting uh, interventions. Um, 
and having direct measure, you could do that to some extent with, with twin and adoption studies, but having direct genomic data allows much more, you know, a wider range of study designs often with, um, uh, allows you to ask questions you couldn't otherwise ask. Um, we could think about um, using the genomic data to target interventions, like um, uh, if we knew who was going to be at risk of declining cognitive health at older ages, help those people, give those people advice to prepare early uh, for, for um, what's coming. So, um, so these are motivating um, uh, kind of applications of the data. I'm actually not going to be talking much at all about these. I'll come back to them a, a little bit at the end. My research has been focused on the logically prior question of which genetic variants are related to behavioral outcomes. How can we construct the predictive variables that we could use as control variables or use to do gene environment interaction studies? And um, you know, this is ultimately what motivates me, and, and I'm, I'm doing my best to encourage uh, good work um, using the results that, um, that we're producing. Um, but, um, but we've been at a stage in the last few years where we haven't yet had the tools to be able to do these applications. And so we're trying to create those tools to allow um, this kind of line of research to emerge. So um, I want to start the talk with a very quick um, genetics primer. And then I'll talk about the kind of the, the story of my own research um, in this area. Um, and then end with some uh, recent, not yet published results on the genetics of educational attainment. So I, I should apologize that this primer um, is going to be way too elementary for those of you who actually know something about genetics. Um, so I'm going to oversimplify the world, and apologies in advance for that. Um, but it should be just <coughs> enough background to be able to follow uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about later. Okay, so DNA is a sequence of three billion uh, pairs of nucleotide molecules um, that are spread in humans across 23 chromosomes. Um, most of that DNA is actually not genes, um, but there are subsequences of these nucleotide molecules um, which are genes. There's about 20 to 25,000 of them, and it's those genes that provide the instructions for building proteins that then go into the body and do things. Um, the rest of DNA, uh, the rest of the DNA may be involved in regulation. Some of it is involved in regulation. Some of it's just not known yet what it's involved in. Um, at most of these locations in the genome, there is no difference across people. It's just the DNA is providing the instructions for how you make a human being. What we're going to be interested in is the small fraction of locations in the genome where there are differences, and those are called polymorphisms. And I'm going to talk in this talk as if there's just one kind of polymorphism, which is a single nucleotide polymorphism, and that's a, that's a, a location in the genome where the nucleotide molecule, the single nucleotide molecule differs between people. There are other kinds of genetic variation. Um, they, in, in the import, most of the important ways, they're very similar to, to single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, so I'm just going to um, ignore them uh, for now. Um, now, at, these, at, at virtually all SNP locations, there are only two possible nucleotide molecules. So these nucleotide molecules are the, the um, A, C, G, T uh, letters. Um, so at a particular location, there's only two of them, say like a C or a T, um, and um, one of those is going to be more common in the population. We call that the major allele, and whichever one is less common, we call the minor allele. And each person gets one allele from each parent. It could be the major allele from both parents, or the major from one, and the minor from the other. Um, and the function of the SNP doesn't depend on who you get the allele from in most cases. And so um, we can summarize your genotype at a given location by the number of minor alleles, a zero, one, or two. Um, so, so what this means is that when we talk about genomic data, it's going to be a, a long vector 
of SNP locations, those are the rows, and each entry is going to be a 0, 1, or 2. Um, now, there's different kinds of genomic data. The kind that you probably hear about most commonly is what's called sequencing data. And sequencing is, is what happened when the Human Genome Project was completed around 2001. And that is when you, have, when you measure pretty much every nucleotide in the genome, so the entire DNA sequence. Um, this, this graph shows the cost. Um, the y-axis here is on a log scale. Um, so part of the point of this, this um, figure is that the costs have been falling extremely rapidly. So in 2001, um, when the Human Genome Project was finished, it cost $100 million to sequence a, a human. Um, and last year, it cost uh, $1,000. Um, and th th this rate of decline is faster than Moore's Law. It's, it's uh, um, just extremely uh, amazing. It's amazing the, the rate of progress in the technology. Now, the kind of data that I'm going to be talking about is not that. It's genotyping data. So genotyping data uh, is where you focus just on the SNPs, so just on the locations of the genome that differ across people, and not even all of those. So typically, you measure um, 2.5 million SNPs, and there's something like 50 or 60 million in the genome. But those 2.5 million are chosen in a way that they capture almost all of the variation across people because the way that the DNA gets inherited from parent to child is it gets inherited in chunks, which means that there's correlation in the genome. Um, it's called linkage disequilibrium. And so, um, and so by measuring these 2.5 million SNPs, you can infer what the other ones are uh, to a pretty high degree of accuracy. Um, and so you know pretty much everything you need to know about the differences across people. Um, so the cost of genotyping has also been following very rapidly. Um, uh, as of last year, recently, it, it costs less than $50 a person um, to get genotyping data. And the cost has been falling by roughly half every year. So it's, um, you know, in a few years, it's going to be the, the main cost of collecting genotyping data is going to be the cost of paying the human subjects to spit in the tube and maybe the cost of the postage to send the sample to the lab and, and get it back, the actual genotyping is going to be small uh, relative to that. OK. So, um, so traditionally, um, the way that we tried to study how particu which particular genes were related to um, behavioral traits or disease traits <coughs> was through what's called a candidate gene study. Um, so a candidate gene study is where you specify some hypothesis, sometimes just one, about just one uh, SNP or a small set, based on what you think the biological function is, um, and then you test whether, in fact, that SNP is associated with um, the outcome of interest. Um, sometimes these are interactions. Sometimes you also include interaction terms if you have a hypothesis about uh, a gene-environment interaction. Um, and you set the significance threshold typically at um, uh, 0.05, the usual level, or sometimes uh, you adjust for multiple testing if you test more than one uh, SNP. Um, and this characterized virtually all of the work in medical genetics up until about 2005, and still characterizes most of the work in social science genetics. Um, it's uh, at, before 2005, it was just too expensive to collect genome-wide data. So you pretty much had to focus on uh, just a small set of, of genetic variants um, in order to be able to afford to do the work. Now, this is, of course, a totally reasonable way to proceed. It's the usual way that we learn about doing science. You make a hypothesis, and then you test it. And there are classic examples uh, where it's worked very well. For example, the discovery of the association between APOE and Alzheimer's. If APOE is um, is the strongest genetic predictor of Alzheimer's. It was discovered because um, it was known what this APOE gene did. It coded for a particular kind of um, uh, beta amyloid protein that was known to be present in the, in the plaques that build up in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients. And so it was a reasonable hypothesis to test that variation in that gene might be related to Alzheimer's. And in the early 90s, that was tested and confirmed. Um, and um, 
you know, that, that, there are other examples of that kind of success, and that helped um, uh, fuel uh, uh, interest in the candidate gene approach in social science. But um, in the later applications of candidate gene approaches in uh, medical genetics, um, and, and in, uh, as well as in social science, um, a lot of the findings uh, haven't replicated very well, or at least you know, the replication has been inconsistent. Um, when, when I got started in this area, um, so I was interested basically from the beginning of graduate school, which for me was in 2001. At that time, there was no data available at all. Uh, and the, the um, uh, norm at the time in the, in the community was that researchers collected their own data and were very protective of it and didn't collaborate with anybody. So it was basically impossible to do anything when I first got interested. Around 2004, I was working with my um, advisors in graduate school, David Leibson and, and Ed Glazer, and we got access to <coughs> data from the Icelandic Heart Association. Um, and at that time, candidate gene studies were the way that you did this kind of work, and so we, um, we did one ourselves. We came up with a list of dopamine and, and serotonin and, and, and other genes that were known to be involved in brain function. Um, and we measured them on a sample of Icelanders, and we had a survey that I, I took some trips to Iceland and put together all the variables that were of potential interest to social scientists. And then we you know, did the usual thing at the time, which was lots of multiple hypothesis testing. We looked for whatever kind of genes related to whichever kinds of outcomes. And we found something. Um, and we were very excited. Uh, it was a, actually it was a, a, an association with education, educational attainment. And we came back to our uh, medical collaborators. Uh, now this was 2007, 2008. And by then, things had changed in the medical world. And there was a lot of skepticism about candidate gene studies. And they said, you know, you have to replicate this before we can try to publish it somewhere. So we went to three other data sets, including one other data set from uh, from the, the same sample in Iceland, um, and I got absolutely zero effect, so no replication at all. So this was my first introduction to this, this world of <laughs> genetics, it was pretty depressing. Um, and um, uh, you know, my collaborators and I spent a long time trying to understand what, what was going wrong, and, and um, uh, Chris, my colleague Chris Chabri, who's a psychologist, led a study that we did on looking at um, systematically at candidate genes that have been found to be associated with IQ and testing whether um, they replicated and when we tested them in much larger samples. We put together a sample of 10,000 people by aggregate meta-analyzing data across three data sets and 10,000 people was much larger than most of these original studies which were based on a few hundred people. Um, and we looked at um, 12 different genetic variants uh, that have been um, down to the literature, and none of them replicated. And that paper was published in 2012. Um, so, um, so, so, you know, at that time, social scientists like us were starting to uh, realize that, that there were some problems, uh, potential problems with this candidate gene approach. It was also, I mean, I don't think it was not broadly recognized. I think it still isn't, you know, completely, fully broadly recognized, but there were, um, corners of the social science genetics world that we're starting to understand this. Um, one, of the, the, one of the field journals, lead field journals, Behavior Genetics, came out with a new editorial policy in that year, 2012, that um, put, um, imposed much stricter standards on candidate gene studies. It said you had to accompany them, for example, with, with a replication. You had to do power calculations and show that um, the study design was, was adequate. And this new editorial policy was accompanied by a very harshly worded um, introduction, so I'll just read the first few sentences. The literature on candidate gene associations is full of reports that have not stood up to rigorous replication. This is the case both for straightforward main effects and for candidate gene by environment interactions. As a result, the psychiatric and behavior genetics literature has become confusing, and it now seems likely that many of the published findings of the last decade are wrong or misleading and have not contributed to real advances in knowledge. And then it goes on to talk about um, why that was true. This editorial policy was subsequently adopted by some other journals in psychology, including uh, Psych Science, which is a top journal in psychology, and the journal Emotion, and, and there may be some others. OK, so why did the, candidate, the traditional candidate gene approach have problems? Well, I think there's basically three issues. 
One is multiple hypothesis testing, which I think we're you know, coming to understand is a much broader problem in social science and in science, um, but it was also a problem in um, the candidate gene literature. There were typically many genetic variants that were measured, um, and often several phenotypes that could be studied in different ways you could specify the regression that you run. And um, they usually weren't all reported in, in the paper, or that you know, some, you would write a paper about the relationship that, that actually worked, um, and that wasn't adjusted for in, in, in interpreting the results. Second issue um, is population stratification. So this is the single biggest confound that comes up in genetic association research. The issue here is that your genotype may be correlated with your ancestry, it will be correlated often with your ancestry, which is in turn correlated with environmental factors that actually matter for the outcome, and it's not the genetic variant. So a classic example of this is um, the chopsticks gene. Let's say you were doing a study to try to find which genes explain the use of chopsticks. So obviously that's not genetic at all, it's totally cultural, but there are plenty of genes that vary, in, the genotype vary in frequency uh, across Asian and non-Asian populations. And so any such um, gene like that is going to show up as seriously associated with chopsticks use. And that's very hard to deal with in the traditional candidate gene study where you've typically just measured a few genetic variants. Um, you controlling for self-reported ancestry is not sufficient um, because there's variation at the sub-ethnic level. Um, we're restricting to whites. Whites is too broad of a category. There's lots of variation among ethnic groups among whites. Um, the third problem, which I want to spend a little bit more time on, um, is low power. Um, so um, the, the issue here is that uh, virtually all, I mean, at the, up to um, maybe last, well, I think it's essentially true that all of the candidate gene studies had samples in the range of 50 to 3,000 in, in social science. Um, many of them were laboratory studies with a few hundred subjects. Which, and so doing a study with that sample size involves an implicit assumption about the magnitude of the effect. So something like you know, an R squared of at least 2% to be reasonably well powered. Um, but there's plenty of reason from the physical and medical literature to be skeptical that those are the, really the effect sizes for particular genetic variants. So for example, the, the um, association between smoking and the, um, the, the SNP and the acetylcholine nicotinic receptor that I mentioned earlier, that's the strongest genetic association with smoking, that has a, about a half percent uh, R squared. The association between BMI and FTO, which is the strongest genetic association with BMI, is about a third of an R square, a third of a percentage point R squared. And for height, where there's now um, over 700 SNPs that are known to be associated with height, the largest of them has uh, an, an association um, with a strength of R squared of 0.4%. Um, now, back in 2012, not all of this was known, but but you know there weren't numbers bigger than this that were credible numbers from the medical and, and um, uh, medical genetics literature. So even back then, you know, if, if we think that the associations between genes and behaviors are, if anything, probably smaller than these, you know, more direct biological effects, we should have been skeptical about findings uh, or, you know, study designs that were only powered to detect effects larger than 2%. Um, now, in, over the last few years, we have credible evidence from large-scale studies of behavioral phenotypes, and they confirm, in fact, that, that, actually, that these, the effect sizes are actually much smaller for behavioral traits. So for example, for educational attainment, the largest effects are about two hundredths of a percentage point R squared, so an order of magnitude smaller than for the medical traits. For depress depressive symptoms or the personality trait neuroticism, it's about four hundredths of a percentage point R squared for the largest association. Subjective well-being is also about two hundredths of a percentage point. These are, again, for, for individual SNP associations. So, um, so let's think about what that implies for the credibility of the um, traditional candidate gene studies. Suppose that we have a significance threshold of 
standard uh, significance threshold. Suppose the strength of the association is um, two hundredth of a percentage point R squared. So what we we're getting for educational attainment for the largest association. And let's say you do a big traditional Cannington study with a sample size of 3,000 people. So then your power is about 12%. Um, and what kind of sample size would you need for 80% power? Well, it turns out you'd need uh, almost 40,000 people. So an order of magnitude bigger than the biggest traditional candidate gene studies that were being done. Now, um, we can also ask another question, which is a Bayesian question, about the credibility of a finding that's significant at the 5% level. So the question is, suppose somebody comes to you, maybe you're reviewing a paper or they, you know, or you find the result yourself and you're not sure whether to believe it. It's significant at the 5% level and you want to ask, what's the likelihood this is a true positive as opposed to a, a, you know, a result by chance? So we can do this calculation um, for different prior probabilities that there truly is an association. So I'll, um, I think that the range of 0.1% to 1% is a plausible range if you're just picking a snip at random in the genome for a trait like educational attainment. 10% um, I would consider to be a, a pretty optimistic prior for, um, you know, for a, a complex trait where you don't have detailed knowledge of the biological pathway. Um, we can do the calculation for, for three different samples, for whatever sample size, I'll show you for three sample sizes. 100 is like a lab experiment, 10,000 would be for, say, a social science survey, and 100,000 would be like a kind of consortium meta-analysis like I'm going to be talking about soon. Um, so looking first at a sample size of 100, um, the power here is just a little bit more than, than 5%. Um, and in this case, even if you start with an optimistic prior of 10% and you find a significant result at the 5% level should barely move your beliefs at all that there's really an effect. So why is that? Well, the, the intuition is that the significance threshold of 5% means that the chance you would have gotten a result um, like you did if there were no effect is 5%. Having power of 5% plus epsilon means that um, if there uh, were an effect, the chance you'd find a result like you did is just a little bit more than 5%. So having found that effect, you barely update at all, because it's about equally likely whether the null is true or the alternative is true. Um, now, it, interestingly, even if you have a, a sample size of 100,000, where your power is 99%, um, and even if you have an optimistic prior of 10%, there's still a significant chance of a false positive. Um, that, you, know, you, should, you should only be about 70% sure that the result is true when it's significant at the 5% level. Um, and, and the reason for this um, is that you can only get, um, if, you, if your significance threshold is only 5%, you can only get so much evidence from finding a significant result. Because you know, the chance you get it, you find the result if there really is an effect, is almost basically 100%, but the chance you'd find it if it's not real is about 5%. So finding an effect, finding a significant result is like 20 to 1 evidence that there really is an effect. Um, but if your prior is as low as 10%, that doesn't, you know, doesn't move you all the way up to like 95%. It's, it's, so in a world where priors are small, um, you actually need um, more significant thresholds than uh, more stringent significance thresholds than five percent in order to get convincing enough evidence that there really is an association. So one of the lessons from genomics is, you know, we're in this world of small priors. Um, we, we need to think about uh, adopting um, different standards for um, for significance. Um, okay, so so in 2005. I think it's fair to say this was pretty well understood in the medical world. Um, and there was a, a, a shift in the kind of study that was done from a candidate gene study to a genome-wide association study. So what is a, a, a genome-wide association study, or GWAS? It's where you, you get this genome-wide data that I talked about before, which these days is about 2.5 million SNPs. And you, a-theoretically, you just test each of them for association 
uh, with the, the outcome. Um, so you don't pretend that you have any kind of you know, adequate biological knowledge to be able to focus on a small number. You, you say, let's <coughs> see what the data tells us. Um, and then you set the significance threshold at what's at the level of, instead of 0 0.05, 5 times 10 to the negative 8th. Um, that's called the genome-wide significance threshold. And there's a couple of ways to think about it. One, one way to think about it is it's a Bonferroni correction that's appropriate for European ancestry populations where there's about a million units of independent variation in the genome. So I mentioned before that there's six, about 60 million SNPs, but there's correlation among the SNPs, so you can calculate what the effective total amount of variation is. It's about a million. So this is the, you know, roughly the Bonferroni correction uh, that you would need. Um, there's also a Bayesian argument um, along the lines of what I was just talking about, that we want to, because our priors are really low, we want to have a really stringent significance threshold so that significance provides enough evidence that there really is an effect to overcome our low priors. <coughs> now, if you have that kind of um, significance threshold, of course, you know, we had a power problem before at a significance threshold of 0.05. Now we really have a power problem. We're going to need much bigger samples. And so along with the shift to genome-wide association studies, there was a change in the culture of research in medical genomics where the studies went from being, you know, looking all, being protective of their own data and not wanting to collaborate to realizing that to publish, they had to meta-analyze, pool their resources and meta-analyze uh, their results across many studies. And so, um, uh, so there emerged consortia um, that, that allow you to get um, sample sizes in the tens of thousands or potentially hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and then there was also, because you had to coordinate across so many different samples, you had to write your analysis plan in advance to make sure that every study did exactly the same thing. And so it became very easy to have a pre-analysis plan that then was straightforward to pre-register. So that just became the normal way that people did work because they had to um, coordinate what everyone was going to do. Okay, so how does this help with the problems I mentioned before? Well, with multiple hypothesis testing, we're now looking at all the measured SNPs, so it makes transparent the multiple hypothesis testing problem, and it's um, addressed with the genome-wide significance <coughs> threshold. For population stratification, yeah, I'm, I, the, for population stratification, um, I mentioned that controlling for self-reported ethnicity is not good enough, but what you can do when you have genome-wide data is you can actually um, estimate ancestry from the data itself. You can look at principal components, which is a measure of, of the kind of joint, you know, accent, dimensions of variation along which people differ in their allele frequencies across many genes, and that tracks ancestry, it turns out, very well. In fact, that's how companies like 23andMe and, you know, tell you your ancestry based on your genomic data, is they're estimating principal components. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can do that and then control for them. And so that actually provides you pretty high resolution control for, for ancestry. It's not a perfect solution to the problem of population stratification, but um, there are other things you can do too that I, um, like uh, you could, for example, look at sibling samples and um, put in sibling fixed effects. So effectively look at whether differences in genotype across siblings predict differences in their outcome. Then you've perfectly controlled for ancestry because you're looking just within a family. That's not possible to do in sufficiently large samples to discover gene associations, because there just aren't big enough sibling samples with genotype data. But you can do it as a robustness analysis. Once you've found the association, then you can look at a few, uh, a few of these variants in sibling samples. Um, okay, and then to, to deal with the low power, um, we have this consortium structure. So let me come back now to the kind of calculation um, we did before, but now looking at genome-wide significance. So the only change here with this Bayesian calculation is that we're, instead of 0.05, we're doing uh, 5 times 10 to the negative 8 for the significance threshold. And you can see that it, a sample size of 100 is basically hopeless. Your power is basically zero for detecting a true association. Even with a sample size of 100,000 with such a stringent significance threshold um, and an effect size of 0.02%, your power is only 16%, which means that you're only going to discover one out of every eight 
SNPs that are truly associated with educational attainment um, with this kind of study design. But um, even with a very low prior, you know, if you find something, it's virtually certain to be, uh, to be, a, true, uh, to be a true positive. Okay. So, um, so now I want to make some of that more concrete and talk about the example of educational attainment, uh, which is um, one of the phenotypes we've been working on in the last few years, and I think this, the behavioral phenotype where we've made the most uh, progress to date. So, um, so I told you about this, this you know, sad story of you know, my collaborators and me and our failed replications, and, and that was basically in 2011. I actually gave versions of this talk back then, and they ended, they were super depressing, and they ended with you know, failed, failed replications. Um, I'm happy to be able to tell you that you know, this current version is going to have a, a, a more optimistic ending. But in 2011, David Cesarini, who was the speaker here last week, um, Phil Kohlinger, uh, and I uh, founded the Social Science Genetic Association Consortium. And basically what we wanted to do was um, imitate what was working in medical genomics. So they had made this shift to genome association studies through consortia, and we thought this is, this is our best chance for making progress in, um, in social science as well. <coughs> the first question that, that we faced was what outcome should we study? Um, and um, we did a lot of power calculations. Um, and the, you know, the, there were um, reasons, there were arguments that maybe we should be focused on something like um, cognitive ability, which is measured by like, you know, hour long tests and has low measurement error and can be measured pretty reliably, or, you know, personality traits. Um, or should we, but the problem with those kinds of, of outcomes is that they're not measured in very many samples, you know, partly because they're so intensive to, to measure and the medical geneticists weren't interested in those outcomes, so they, did, they weren't measuring them. So they, you know, that might have been a you know, sample of 10,000 people. Or we could study something like educational attainment, which had the key advantage that it was measured in all of these medical data sets because people studying cardiovascular disease and cancer and everything, they were measuring education as a background variable, so they had the genome-wide data. Um, the problem there, though, is obviously educational attainment is extremely far from what the effects of genes do. It's you know, highly socially um, uh, influenced, and you know, there's different institutions across different countries, and people told us at the time that um, it was crazy for us to study education. We were throwing our careers away by, by, by making that choice. Um, but um, we did the power calculations and, and we came to the conclusion that if we could get 100,000 people with educational attainment, you were actually going to have a better chance of finding something than studying you know, even 25,000 people with a, with a you know, kind of, uh, better measured variable. So we decided to pursue educational attainment. Um, the first uh, paper, which we now look back on and call it EA1, um, was, um, and we ended up recruiting from among medical genetics uh, data sets, 41 uh, data sets, with a total sample size of 100,000, um, which was, you know, really just a totally different order of magnitude than any of the work in social science genetics up to that time, and similar to the kinds of sample sizes that were um, available now for the largest, at the time, for the largest medical studies. Um, we had, um, we looked at two outcome variables, a measure of years of schooling and a, and a binary variable for completing college. Um, we did this kind of study the way these consortium studies are generally done, which is we had a, an analysis plan to make sure that every, that every genome-wide association study in each data set was done the same way with the same kind of controls. Um, which, which, by the way, they're, they're, you know, because you're, you're trying to, to um, make it doable for all of these data sets, it means you don't have that many controls. It's not very good social science in the sense of like, you know, modeling the, the um, environmental heterogeneity or anything. It's just kind of you know, the, the, the dirtiest thing you can do that's halfway reasonable, like control for sex and age and make sure you um, um, map educational systems in different countries onto a common international standard. So each of these studies did their own analysis, and then they uploaded their GWAS results to a, a secured central server. Um, and then, um, and typically then they make tons of mistakes, um, uh, and 
we don't have access to the individual level data because of privacy and IRB concerns. So we just have to tell them what analysis to do and, and they can try to diagnose where the errors are. And we're just looking at the summary statistics and trying to figure all this out. So this takes months um, of back and forth. Um, once we are sure we have clean results, then we meta-analyze the GWAS results to obtain the overall regression coefficients of standard errors. Um, and what we found in the end was one uh, genome-wide significant association with the years of education measure and two with the college measure. And then uh, following um, the, what had become standard, in the medical genetics literature, we had a replication phase of the project where we recruited 12 more uh, data sets that, you know, there's more and more of these data sets that are getting gen genome-wide data then and now because it's getting so inexpensive and so more, there's more of this data becoming available so we could recruit new data sets that weren't available for the discovery part of the project. And this sample size was 25,000 people, um, and all three uh, of the associations replicated uh, at the Bonferroni corrected 5% level. So this paper was published in 2013 um, in Science. This is um, uh, a Manhattan plot. So this is the typical way you'll see the results from genome-wide association studies illustrated. What, what is happening on the x-axis is that's, it's just, it's the whole genome laid out across the, all the chromosomes. Um, and each of the points is a SNP. And the reason they're, they're, it looks like just a solid mass is because there's so many of them, so they're all lying on top of each other. The y-axis is significance. It's the p-value on a negative log 10 scale, so that higher numbers mean more significant. And this bar here, is the, the, the black bar is the genome-wide significance threshold. Um, so what you see in this kind of figure is there's lots of these towers that show up. Um, and that's, this is called a Manhattan plot because of the towers, of like the <laughs> skyline of Manhattan. Um, and the reason why there are these towers is because of the correlation of the genome. So when, when one of the SNPs is highly associated with the trait, it's highly correlated with nearby SNPs, and so they also tend to be highly correlated. Um, and what you see here is this is the results for college. You see these two towers here that peak above the genome wide significance line. Those are the two uh, hits for, for college. Um, and one thing you can, you can understand easily looking at a figure like this is that what you find in a genome wide association study is not a particular a SNP or a particular gene that's associated with the trait. What you're really finding is a region. You know, we're saying there's something in this area here where all of these SNPs are correlated with that's associated with the outcome. And you have to do follow-up analysis and, and you know, maybe work at, study the biology and try to figure out which, where is actually the causal SNP or the, the gene that matters. Yeah? Either of these two was the one that was correlated with years of schooling? So it sounded like you had There was a third one that was correlated with years of schooling. I, I, think, I think it's this one here that doesn't okay. reach okay. significance in college. <clears throat> okay. So that was in 2013. I mean, there's lots of other analysis in the paper. I'm just going to... You know, for time, I'm going to skip, um, skip to the next part of the story, which is we call EA2, which we were able to do a few years later. It's published last year. We were able to increase the sample size because, again, there's more and more data sets with genome-wide data. But now we have 63 data sets with about 300,000 people. Um, we decided now to just focus on years of schooling and forget about the binary college variable. And now we find 74 SNPs. Uh, independent SNPs that are associated with, um, uh, with education. And while that, this paper, EA2, was under review, the, um, a big new data set became um, available called the UK Biobank. It's now 500,000 people, but the, the first initial release was 110,000 people, or 150,000, 110,000 of which had data on educational attainment. And we were then we were able to use that data um, in our revision of the paper as a replication sample. Um, and the replication was, was, uh, was extremely strong. So um, 72 out of the 74 hits had the same sign in the replication. 52 of them were significant at the 5% level. Seven of them reached genome-wide significance. And what we can do is compare this replication record to what you would expect given sampling variation and this kind of size of the replication sample under the hypothesis that all of the effects were true hits in the, in the original discovery. And it turns out this replication record is, if anything, a little bit better than you would expect if all of the original hits were, were true. Yeah? What's the reason for doing this as a replication rather than integrating the data with the 
large data set? We also did that. So with that, you get 162 hits. But this was a way to test kind of robustness. Yeah. So this is, uh, OK. Actually, I thought, um, sorry, this is, these slides are a little out of order. This actually shows the replication. This, this shows for each, the 74 SNPs are on the um, x-axis here. The y-axis is the effect. And here I'm showing it in years of schooling. The black points, 95% confidence intervals, are the um, effect sizes in the discovery sample of 300,000. And the blue, uh, blue ones uh, are from the 110,000 replication sample. So you can see visually the effect sizes are generally quite similar um, across the two. OK, so that paper was published last year in, in Nature. Um, We've been partly because that paper took a very long time to get published, and partly because just the, the this tremendous growth in the availability of data. By now, we've actually been able to further expand the sample size dramatically. So we're going to tell you now about work that's still in progress. Um, we now have a sample of 70 data sets with 1.1 million people in educational attainment. Um, and now we're finding 1,271. Uh, independent SNPs. So here's the Manhattan plot. It's actually totally uninformative now with this kind of scale of the data because basically it looks like everything is significant, which it isn't. It's just that you can't tell the difference between the places that are significant and the places that aren't. Um, now, um, you know, finding those SNPs is very useful for some of the kinds of analysis we want to do with um, GWAS results, so for example, the, the biology, learning about the biology, having lots of hits gives us a lot of information to study which genes might be related to the outcome. Um, and we do that in, in these papers and um, find some interesting things. For example, you know, as you'd expect, the genes related to educational attainment are very highly expressed in the brain. But it turns out that, they're, that glial cells don't seem to be involved. In, that basically, the, the, the um, uh, genes that have differential expression in glial cells don't show up as particularly strongly related to educational attainment. So it doesn't seem to be about that part of the brain. So I'm not, not going to talk about the biology here, but I, I want to talk about it now, just tell you a little bit about this other thing that comes out of these GWAS studies that I think is the most useful thing for social science, which is the polygenic scores. So these are not the individual SNPs, but the indexes of many SNPs that when you combine their predictive power can add up to a lot and you can use for control variables or to do well power gene environment interaction studies, um, for example. So what I'm showing you here, and, and I'm, I'm um, you know, basically the way you construct these polygenic scores loosely is you take the coefficient, the regression coefficients that come out of the GWAS and you adjust for the correlation across the, the, the fact that the SNPs are correlated with each, with each other. And then you basically created a weighted sum of the genotypes, where you weight by the effect size of the SNP. And so you get a maximally predictive linear index of the genome-wide data for predicting the outcome. So what I'm showing you here is how much predictive power you can get from, um, from these polygenic scores um, uh, and how that's changed as our sample sizes have gotten bigger for the GWAS studies. So this is our EA1 polygenic score, and it's showing you this for two different, so the x-axis here is the sample size of the study, the y-axis is the predictive power of the polygenic score in terms of R squared. Um, I'm showing you results for two different validation samples, the Ad Health uh, data set, which is um, a sample of, of um, young people uh, that's nationally representative, and the HRS is a sample of people over the age of 50 that's nationally representative. And so they're not included in the GWAS discovery sample, so this is an out-of-sample assessment of their predictive power. Um, from EA1, we were getting 3 to 4% uh, predictive power for the polygenic score. For the, the 300,000 from EA2, we were getting about 6 or 7%. When we combine the data, to, as you were suggesting, it'll be about 400,000 people. Then it goes up to about 7 to 8%. What we're now getting in EA3 is between 10 and 12% um, R squared. So we're explaining, I just want to repeat that because it's actually pretty remarkable. 10 to 12% of the variance across people in their educational attainment is being explained by the genome-wide data alone. So that's huge compared to any kind of effect sizes you typically get in um, in studies of education. 
Um, here's another way of looking at that kind of level of predictive power. Um, here, what I'm doing is, uh, is cutting the sample, cutting the polygenic score into quintiles. So this is the lowest fifth of the polygenic score distribution. This is the highest fifth. And the y-axis here is the frequency of completing college. So depending on the data set, it's about 10% of the people complete college who are in the lowest polygenic score quintile. In the highest polygenic score quintile, it's between 40 and 55%. So you know, huge, um, you know, huge amount of, of predictive power for college completion. Um, this, what I'm showing here on the top, is comparing the predictive power of the polygenic score against other common predictors of education. So you can still predict a higher amount of variance if you use cognitive ability or measures of parents' education. They predict a little bit better than our best current polygenic score. But we're predicting more than you can predict with income. Okay. Um, so let me, you know, there's a lot of other things in, in, in the paper which I'll, um, I, I won't have time to talk about. I, let me just mention a couple of things. One is, um, you know, w when we started this work, one of the big concerns that we heard was that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the environments and we should expect the effects of genes are gonna vary a lot depending on which country we're talking about and even within a country. And that's a totally valid, reasonable concern, something we needed to try to account for in our power calculations. And now we, can, now we have evidence for it. We can quantify the extent to which that's true. We can look at things like um, how much heterogeneity is there um, in the genetic effects. So we can look at, you know, this is the average genetic correlation, which is roughly speaking, it's, it's asking for a given SNP, how correlated is, it, is its effect in one <coughs> data set with its effect in another data set? And the answer is, you know, significantly different from one, it's 0.7. Um, so there's substantial heterogeneity. Um, and the, the thing, I, you know, one of the big takeaway messages um, from, from this talk is that um, with the levels of predictive power we're now getting from the polygenic score, the kind of promises that I started out with, the, reason, you know, the, things that we sh the reasons why we might be excited about genomic data in the social sciences, they're now real. Like, we can, we can really start doing them. So, for example, um, with a predictive power of 10%, if you wanted to study the effect of the polygenic score for educational attainment, you'd have 80% power to detect its effect at the 5% level in a sample of only 75 people. So we can now go back to the lab. We can do laboratory studies like you know, we were trying to do with candidate gene studies, but do them with polygenic scores and be well powered. Um, we can also start using these polygenic scores as control variables. So if, it, if you're increasing your um, variance explained in education from 10% to 20% by including the polygenic score in your randomized experiment, you're reducing the required sample size for any given level of power by 11%. And that can be real cost savings with an expensive kind of intervention. Um, now I've been talking about education, but with the SSGAC, we've been, doing, we've been studying a lot of uh, other phenotypes as well. Um, so fertility, subjective well-being, risk tolerance, um, um, dietary uh, intake. And so these and other phenotypes um, are ones where in the near future we'll also have um, highly predictive uh, polygenic scores. Um, and so let me, um, so let me just end by, by, um, uh, by commenting that I think we're seeing a real, ch we're starting to see a real change in social science genetics. So um, you know, we know of at least 74 ongoing projects that are using the uh, Educational Attainment Polygenic Score. We know that because on our website where we make the, the results publicly available, we ask people to describe, you know, if they're going to use the data for something so we can try to keep track. Um, there's some really interesting um, papers that have, that have been coming out. For example, there's a paper that Dan Belsky and... Um, are you a co-author of them? No. Okay. But there's a number of... Uh, it's a really good paper that came out in Psych Science last year looking at the educational polygenic score and um, trying to, to map out how, you know, what it predicts over the life course to understand the mechanisms by which the genes seem to be mattering. So finding things like it's related to um, early speech acquisition and its effects seem to be um, largely operating through cognitive ability, but also through person some personality traits like openness to experience. 
There's also now work using po the polygenic scores to do well-powered, well-identified gene environment interaction studies. So for example, my uh, colleagues, um, uh, some of my colleagues have a paper where they're, they're looking at the um, change in the compulsory schooling law in the UK, where people were required to go to an additional year of schooling, eighth grade and ninth grade, um, and looking at the effects, using that to look at the causal effect of education on health outcomes like BM, BMI. And prior work has found that the average effects on health outcomes are really small and not statistically distinguishable from zero. But what they're finding is when they use a polygenic score for BMI to look at heterogeneity in the effect, there's really big differences, that there's basically very big effects in people who are at the high end of the polygenic score distribution. So people who are genetically predicted to have high BMI are really affected a lot by that additional year of education. It reduces their BMI by a lot. And it's the people at the low end um, who weren't predicted to have high BMI anyway who were barely affected at all by the additional year of schooling. Um, and I think this is, you know, the um, amount of work in this area is just going to continue to um, mushroom in the coming years because this, the genome-wide data is becoming so inexpensive to collect, available in so many more data sets, you know, easy to collect it yourself in a, in a lab experiment if you want. And our genomic knowledge is correspondingly growing very quickly. And so we're going to be able, in the very near future, to construct predictive polygenic scores across a very wide range of traits that we'd be interested in. Let me stop there.